between parts. It is a space of inertia where we suspend all limiting ideas of human potential in an authentic effort to move from darkness to light by discovering the true nature of reality. Welcome back to the Absolute Reason Podcast. I am Joan, your freaky philosopher, and this is where we explore and discover spiritual intelligence. Now, what exactly is spiritual intelligence? Well, it is a deeper understanding of what is this creation and what is my relationship to it. Now today, we will be observing this concept of spiritual intelligence, but we will overlay it onto the human body vessel. In other words, what does it mean to understand the creation that is your body and what is your relationship to it? But before I continue with the body vessel, let me just quickly point to where exactly I gain the knowledge of spiritual intelligence. Everything I teach within spiritual intelligence, as well as the body vessel, all that knowledge is gained from the Chandogya Upanishad. And as per the publisher's preface, the Chandogya Upanishad speaks to what is the matter-of-fact consideration of the issues of life. It revolves around your everyday life and your experience thereof. It is a focus on the visible forms of experience, which is why I can gain knowledge around the body vessel from the Chandogya Upanishad because it teaches me about the visible forms of this physical experience. So I hope that just at least gives you an idea that everything I teach is based on ancient mystical texts specifically from India. So let us move on. So let us begin with a quick overview as to what is the agenda for this specific podcast on the body vessel. I will start out with a couple of definitions, uh, definitions around what is the evolutionary process, what is meditation really, what is an action, and ultimately what is karma. Then I will move on to what are the four walls of the body vessel. These four walls will be explored through hunger, thirst, sleep and dying. But I will just do a quick and a light overview onto those four walls. But I will go into depth around the specific wall of hunger. And it is when we explore hunger that I will go into the five pranas, the five life forces of the body vessel. This is your eyes, your ears, speech, mind and touch. But I will end off with how the microcosm of our sensory perception links with the macrocosm of the planetary system. This would then relate to the sun, 
the moon, the earth, light and space. So ultimately at the end of this podcast, you will leave with a better understanding of the basic definitions. You will understand on a basic level the four walls of the body vessel. But you will leave with a deeper understanding as to how this, what happens within the individual, our sensory perceptions, how that links with everything that is outside of us with a specific focus on the planetary system. Doesn't that sound quite interesting? The microcosm, the macrocosm. This will even set you up to understand why something like star signs actually has a very truthful effect on the individual. It is interesting stuff we're going to hit today. So without any further delay, let's hit it. So we have all heard about evolution, the evolutionary process of the physical body. But because we are busy with spiritual intelligence, I wondered how many of you have heard of spiritual evolution. And this is why I decided to include the definition from the Chandogya Upanishad as to what exactly is the evolutionary process. The Chandogya Upanishad teaches that just as varieties of furniture can be resolved into the cause, which is wood, so is the case with any other manufactured object. There is a tendency of every effect to return to its cause. This is what we call the evolutionary process. It is impossible for the effect to rest in itself because of the pull exerted by the cause. So everything is restless, everything moves, everything tries to overcome its own limitations and to entertain higher and higher objectives until it reaches the pure being. If that definition left you with a little bit of a question mark on your forehead, don't you worry about it. That's why you have your freaky philosopher. Let me quickly go into this with a little bit more detail. Ultimately, what the Chandogya Upanishad is teaching is that every effect has a cause. And when you look at the cause of wooden furniture, the cause of the effect is wood. Wood is the cause, the effect is wooden furniture. But there is a tendency of every effect to return to its cause. What do I mean by this? I mean that if you had to leave a wooden piece of furniture outside, let's say it will just speed things up a little bit, and you leave it and you don't nurture it and you don't maintain it, that wood will ultimately, or the wooden furniture, would ultimately return to to its cause it will crumble it will it will form mold and ultimately the entire structure will fall apart and the furniture will once again become nothing more than wood this is the difference between cause and effect Effect is a temporary thing, but the cause remains constant. It is the effect that is restless. It is the effect that makes everything move. But it is your cause, the intention behind the creation, that ultimately defines the effect created. Okay, so in a nutshell, wood is wood. And wooden furniture will go back to being wood. Human is human and your human body is merely an expression of all the coming together of all the parts within you. And that 
physical expression, the effect is defined by your cause, the threefold nature of who you are, your will, your knowledge, and how you act. I hope that makes a little bit more sense. On we go to the next definition, the definition for meditation. The Chandogya Upanishad teaches that any meditation is the attempt of the mind to bring all the parts of the psychic organ into a single focus of organic action. The one who meditates on the cosmic being does not consume food merely for the satisfaction of the body, but for the satisfaction of everything. So in a nutshell, meditation is an effort of the mind to bring all the parts of the psychic organ into a single focus. So how is this then, meditation, different to a practice such as mindfulness? Well, there is a very simple difference and it's all about intention. Mindfulness tends to come with the instruction that you must focus purely on your own physical being. And that is where it begins and ends. So it's a very much a, a bit of a selfish action. It is a total focus on me, myself and I. Whereas meditation, when you do meditation, you come in with the intention to bring all the parts of your psychic organ into a single focus. This means I have an awareness that there is both a micro and a macrocosm being and that the psychic organ includes both of these parts. There is a relationship and it is with the intention to have a focus on both the macro and the microcosm that one makes that act of mindfulness and you turn it from a selfish action, something that focuses merely on the individual, but by changing the intention, you turn it into a cosmic action and all of a sudden mindfulness becomes an act of meditation because you are now focusing the mind to bring all the parts of the psychic organ into a single focus and then you have the action of meditation. It is then through the action of meditation that you no longer only consume food merely for the satisfaction of your body, but for the satisfaction of everything. Because now, through knowledge gained, you understand that there is a cosmic being you wish to uh, connect with that cosmic being while you are eating because you understand it is not just for the satisfaction of yourself but for the satisfaction of everything. So let us go look at the next definition which will actually teach us a little bit more about the previous two definitions. The one of the evolutionary process which is obviously all about action as well as meditation which is also an action. So let's go see what the Chandogya Upanishad teaches. It says that if one performs any action with this knowledge, this knowledge of the micro and the macrocosm, then whatever he does is a universal action. It is for the good of everyone and everyone's action becomes that person's action. Just as the movement of any wave anywhere in the ocean is the ocean itself working. It is in this meditation, in other words, this very action of fixed focus, pointed attention, that an understanding of the knowledge is formed by the individual. Of the transference of the human attributes, who you are as an individual, to the divine existence and vice versa. 
it speaks to the fact that there is a constant give and take between you as an individual as well as the divine existence. There is a give and take relationship between the micro and the macrocosm. Then once you understand that concept, then, instead of one contemplating oneself as the individual body, one begins to contemplate oneself as the universal body. And it is with that that your actions then begin to show and produce beneficial results. It is all about intention and intention is defined by the knowledge you gain as an individual so that is action action is all about this give and take uh, relationship between your human attributes and then the divine existence now if that kind of sounds like karma you are spot on which is why our next definition is about karma. So let us go see what the Upanishad teaches about karma. Selfish action originating from one's own personality for the satisfaction of oneself alone will lead to bondage. Because ignorance of one's inward connection with the higher sources is a danger to oneself. And they will react upon the individual for this ignorance. This reaction is called karma. Karma is the name we give to the way in which the law of reality acts upon all particulars or individuals. It reacts upon everyone and everything when one is in a state of ignorance. And it is that state of ignorance that we are trying to overcome with the developing of our spiritual intelligence. Let us have a quick recap on the definitions that will be helpful as we further develop our spiritual intelligence. We have learned that the evolutionary process is all about cause and effect. We learned that it is the cause that is fixed and constant, but it is the effect that is ever moving and pushing us as individuals to entertain higher and higher objectives. Then we learned that meditation is about the attempt of the mind to bring all the parts of the psychic organ into a single focus of organic action. We do this with an understanding that it's not all about the individual, but that there is a micro and a macrocosm, and there is a relationship between these two parts. And so when we meditate, we meditate on the whole, and not merely on me, myself, and I. Then we learned that action is one that can only offer, or action is can only offer beneficial results if we have a specific type of knowledge. If you don't know how to operate the machine, you will never get proper manufacturing out of that machine. This is what we learned about action. We need proper knowledge around what exactly is this creation and our relationship to it. Once we have this proper knowledge, then we can begin to reduce the karmic cycle. And what exactly is karma? Karma is the name we give to which the law of reality acts upon all particulars or individuals. In other words, if you only do or perform selfish actions, that is not in line with the law of reality, the natural order of things. And that is when karma is going to come for you. 
But if you perform actions, meditations, and so your overall evolutionary process with the mindset or with the perspective that everything is connected, there is an intelligent design. Cause and effect happens between your microcosm, that which is inside, and the macrocosm, that which is outside. Once we align better with the natural law of reality, we begin to escape the bondage of karma. Just before we move on to the body vessel and after all of the definitions that really focused on the oneness of all, I thought it would be a good spot for me to explain the creative spelling around my name, Joan. Joan is actually my second name and although differently spelt on my passport, it is still my name. But I chose a creative spelling with Joan by ending it with the word one. The reason for that is that I have made a direct link with my personal liber liberation to the liberation of all. My name serves as a reminder of that constitution that governs everything I do. Everything I do and everything I teach is governed by the law of one. The fact that I understand there is a clear relationship between my actions and your actions. I hope it clears, uh, clears it up a little bit. I don't have spelling issues, people. I know how to spell. And if I don't, I can look at my passport or I can even do a spell check. It's really there with a very specific intention. And that intention is that you are my absolute reason. So now that we have completed the basic definitions, you understand why I spell my name funny. Now we can finally move on to exploring the four walls of the body vessel. These four walls are hunger, thirst, sleep and dying. Although I, do, I will do a quick review on all four of these walls, I will, however, only go into depth regarding this number one, hunger. So let's first have a quick overview as to what exactly we mean with these very four walls. What is it that surrounds us? What contains us? What is it that gives us shape? Oh, it feels like I need to give you a bit of a warning before I continue. Hold on to your hats because it's about to get very abstract. Ne? But don't you worry. Abstract just basically means that it will help if you think in pictures. So let's go look at hunger with a specific focus on food. And remember, all of this knowledge is gained from the Chandogya Upanishad. It teaches that the food that we take is turned inside by the forces of our body. And the essential part of the food rises up into the structure of the psychological organ. It becomes the essence of our thinking process. It becomes the mind. Now an interesting story around just exactly how food influences your psychology. I obviously at one stage became a vegetarian. I didn't do it because somebody told me to do it. I don't operate that way. I, you know, to take instruction, uh, it's, it's difficult for me. It really depends on who gives it. So, so it was very much a natural, intuitive impulse from my body to go into a vegetarian diet. And I noticed a couple of things. I'm Afrikaans. I'm a boor. 
we are by nature very bombastic people we express ourselves verbally very loud and direct as well as the fact that i used to be a rugby player which means i have a bit of aggression in my system also it became very helpful on the rugby field i can promise you that so but i noticed when i went vegetarian that i was a lot softer in my nature i didn't fight as easily i didn't use harsh, harsh words as quickly i was a bit calmer in my temperament and as you may have noticed from my words i am no longer vegetarian i eat meat i eat any meat all meat sometimes i only eat meat and sometimes i only eat vegetables my system has found a balance that works for it but my point with the story is that through personal experience, I can tell you there is a psychological effect on the individual between eating vegetables only and then eating meat. There's a basic uh, reason for this. When, when you eat vegetables, it's considered as food moving into life you know you pick it and you basically eat it so it's still alive it still has that um, prana force active within it whereas meat because you have to kill it first and then consume it you must understand that that is food considered moving out of life which means it is now deteriorating and if it deteriorates as a food particle it will also have that same type of counter effect on your psychological organ is it moving into life or is it moving out of life you can find a very happy balance between the two as i have done but i do suggest that you have a vegetarian diet have it for about two weeks only vegetarian and note observe and take 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 notice of how your temperament changes that is how you learn about yourself and then after those two weeks you can adjust and move back to your normal diet don't go insane just eat vegetables you don't need to go vegan if you are not vegan eat vegetables a plant-based diet because what we want is we want to consume food that is moving into life and not necessarily food moving out of life we're doing it to observe the difference in our temperament once we've learned it you can move back to your normal diet on we go to the second wall of the body vessel and that is thirst the chandogya upanishad couples hunger and thirst and it teaches that there is no effect without a cause there it is again cause and effect the water element liquefies the physical food draws the essence of it inward and exhausts the contents of the food that you have taken so you feel hungry again in spite of you having eaten food the water principle draws then gross food back into itself so when food is dissolved by water and water is then absorbed by the fire principle within the organ within the organic system then it is converted into energy in the system in other words water leads food to its proper place within the body vessel which is why the constant in any diet um, that we have learned of or heard of is the fact that we need to drink a lot of water and it's for this very reason that the Chandogya Upanishad actually expands on the reason for us having to drink water it helps us to liquefy the food and once it is more liquefied then it can be absorbed by the body through the fire principle 
on we go to the third wall of the body vessel and that is sleep now sleep anybody who knows me knows that I say sleep is my superpower I can sleep anywhere anytime any place I just love to sleep but I've never been able to really find a lot of information around it. Also, I didn't really look that hard. But the point is, it's not common to find good information around sleep. So I was very excited to see it in the Chandogya Upanishad. So just as a basic, let's look at what it teaches us around sleep. One gets absorbed into oneself in sleep. You become yourself in sleep. That is why there is no consciousness of anything external. Then one gets absorbed into the true being that one is. It is in sleep where you get into yourself. You enter yourself. You become yourself and know nothing but yourself. But you cannot go beyond the limitation of the thread. You go in search of freedom, but you cannot find it because your movement is restricted. So in sleep, the mind withdraws itself every day due to the exhaustion of its activity, which is the consequence of its search vainly for the freedom that it cannot find in the outer world. Now, what exactly is this freedom that we are yearning for and reaching for? Well, you have heard me say before that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. That freedom we strive for during sleep is that spiritual essence of who we are. But we still have a physical attachment and that is the thread that restricts us into um, not being able to move into full liberation. We are sleeping. We are not dead. So there, there, there is still a cord that keeps us attached to this physical experience. And that is why we wake up. But it is during sleep that we lose consciousness because our mind withdraws itself in search of that freedom. On we go to the fourth wall of the body vessel, which is death, dying, people die you know you're going to die although in the last couple of years i don't know people just seem to have forgotten that they're going to die and we all became oh so scared I'm scared of everything i'm scared no you're going to die let me just break it to you the point is not are you going to die the point is to know that you will die and how important it is to live now so let's see how the Chandogya Upanishad uh, explains dying to us. Individual life gets extinguished by a gradual process of absorption of the external functions into the internal ones until they are finally withdrawn into the general reality in all things. There is a sudden shift of emphasis from one level of being to another. So from the point of view of the external occurrences of the various phenomena of withdrawal, death and liberation are identical. So in a nutshell, if while we, when we sleep, we reach for the freedom of our true nature, that spiritual essence of who we are. But we can't really fully reach that liberation because we are still connected to the physical experience. Well, that is when we sleep. But when we die, 
that is when this chord between your spiritual natural state and then this physical experience well it gets separated and that is when you have the sudden shift of emphasis from one level of being to another so the Chandogya Upanishad teaches that death is not the end but merely a change of a uh, being, a change of energy, a way of life that is different to this physical experience, but in no way an end to who we are as spiritual beings. Dying and uh, liberation are then identical because when you die that core is separated and when your mind and your entire being withdraws it is no longer held or connected to this physical experience and it is allowed to move further back and withdraw into the natural state of spiritual being that is what we call general reality This brings us to the end of this podcast. We looked at the definitions of the evolutionary process, meditation, action and karma. We also explored the basic understanding of the four walls of the body vessel, hunger, thirst, sleep and dying. What we haven't done is the five pranas. I said we're going to do it in this podcast. But I have run out of time, so I will cover the five pranas in our next podcast. So until then, I am Joan, your freaky philosopher, and you are my absolute reason.